stand up this morning. We're going to worship God. Lord, we thank you that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We give you adoration this morning. Lord, we come against that foul, demonic, and oppressive spirit activity in any way that we try to rule and reign mentally, physically, and spiritually. We bring care and before you this morning. Lord, we thank you. You are a miracle working God. We thank you that, Lord, you have stepped in. We thank you, Lord, that that whole respiratory system, Lord, we thank you that his lungs will breathe out the breath of God. We thank you that, Lord, as we hear reports from today, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, that, Lord, he's growing, Lord, from strength to strength. And then we thank you that, Lord, you are giving him that enabling power. Lord, we just decree and declare your kingdom come. Your will be done, Lord, over this region, over our town, over our city, over our nation. We decree it. That, Lord, you will bring us, Lord, to that place of repentance. That, Lord, you will bring us into our knees. That that place of the altar that would alter us, Lord. We thank you for Boris, Lord. We pray you'll give them wisdom. Give them knowledge, Lord. More than anything else, Lord. We decree and declare salvation. Lord, salvation comes to number 10 downing street lord we decree and declare that lord that soul lord would not lord be in despair but lord that his soul would prosper lord i pray lord wherever there's deceit lies or deception lord in this government in this council lord from national to international lord to locally to globally lord i pray that your light would shine and that lord your light would expose the darkness lord whatever tricks whatever schemes whatever scams the enemy is trying to run lord we thank you that your word says that we lift you high jesus Jesus, the Christ, then you will draw men and women to yourself. The Bible says, and you decree this, you declared that, and every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that you are Jesus Christ, the Lord. We take authority, we bind the strong man this morning, and we loose the captive. We bind the strong man, and we loose the captive, Lord, over our lives, mentally, spiritually, physically, relationally, Lord, over our community, Lord, over over our nation right now. Lord, whatever deceit the enemy is trying to bring, whatever blindfold, whatever mask the enemy is causing us to wear, Lord, we just decree this morning that we bind the strong man, Lucifer, you shapeshifter. We bind you this morning through the precious blood of Jesus Christ and we loose the captives, loose them and let them go. Lord, we speak to the backslider, north, south, east and west, Lord. Lord, your word says, Lord, that you are married to the backslider. We call them back to your kingdom. Lord, we decree and declare, Lord, those that are addicted to substance abuse and violence, sexual activity, whatever it is this morning that people are addicted to, religious addiction, hierarchical spirits, Lord. We pull them down through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We go, Lord, this morning right into the darkness and we speak hope. We speak life. Lord, where there is death that has been prescribed, we speak life. We speak life into our community. Where there is financial depravity in local businesses, Lord, we speak life. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will bring finances. Even anybody this morning, even in this auditorium, that you will bring finances from unexpected sources. Lord, checks in the mail. We didn't realize you had coming. Cash advancements, Lord, for the extension of your kingdom, Lord, around this globe. We pray, Lord, for local council, that you will give them strategy. Lord, we pray, Lord, for the local NHS, that you, you would intervene, Lord. We pray, Lord, for the police, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would move by your spirit in this season. We pray, Lord, that you would offer your peace. We decree and declare your shalom peace over every sphere of influence that every one of us represented here this morning goes into. Whether it's in family, whether it's in a workplace, whether it's in a school environment, whether it's in the NHS environment, whether it's in the police force, whether it's in council, local government, Lord, whatever sphere of influence we find ourselves in, let us be carriers of that peace in the precious name of Jesus. Everybody said... Every Bible says you can decree a thing and it shall be established. We need to take back the ground that the enemy has stolen from us. You know, decree it and declare it this morning that we take back what the enemy has stolen in the precious name of Jesus. Um, Come on, let's we worship together, God this morning. And that, um, you know, we're better together than we are apart. Um, and I don't mean that in a religious way, in a religious duty. Uh, I mean that in the, you know, in the kingdom of God, the Bible is about relationship. It's about covenant, it's about relationship, it's about us standing together and about us walking this journey together. And, um, you know, I've served some great leaders over the years. Um, 
and some leaders that have taught relationship and not known how to walk it and I've had some that have expressed it wonderfully well and um, one of my keys is relationship and is being together and um, and I feel for us in this season and in the season that we're in and the season that's going to be with us for a while is that it's important for us to have an understanding of what it is to be together. Um, and there's some things, uh, some scriptures that have kind of just, um, things that have been going on over in my heart over the past week or so, and, and probably a, a few months, through this kind of lockdown period and season. I'm kind of an interesting person. Um, as you will all understand and know, okay, I'm not your normal cup of Yorkshire tea, okay, um, not that I drink tea, I'm a, well, I do drink a bit more herbal tea nowadays, actually, because trying to cut out the coffees and drink more water and I'll be a bit more herbal on my journey, um, but I do feel that in this season, even for me, who is, people would say, Denver, you're very um, outgoing, um, you're very loud issue, kind of quite chatty. Um, to be honest with you, get me over a coffee and a meal and I enjoy that. Um, pulpit stuff to me is, is, is not something that I desire or have desired. Um, it very much, uh, I was an automobile and worked on cars for quite a number of years when I left school. Um, and to me, it's an anointing thing. I don't have an education. I don't have a PhD. I don't have a doctorate. Um, any of that type of stuff when it comes to the Bible. And I'm not saying that in an arrogant way. I'm just saying that in a way of being open and honest. Uh, I grew up on a housing estate in Keithley, uh, Bracken Bank, 101 Bracken Bank. Okay, so, um, and then lived in Keithley till about 97, coming over from Ireland and various things and went to great schools, uh, but just preferred to play the, the clown. But in this season, what I found is, is that, you know, at the beginning, it was difficult. In the middle, I enjoyed it. And then towards the end, I felt like it was dragging itself out a bit. You know, like, well, you can meet in a garden with six people. Now, you can't meet in a garden. You can go to a pub and watch a football match, but you can't go to church. Um, you can go to church, but you can't socialize. You can gather in groups of 30. Now you can gather in groups of how many you want, but just make sure you don't socialize. Um, but you can go to church and gather with 100 people as sure as you're spaced out. Very interesting. And now all of a sudden, it changes, and then all of a sudden, we go down to a lockdown and now it's changed um, that the only um, vital necessities can stay open so you can buy vodka and you can buy your booze and you can buy your cigarettes but you can't come to church and have anybody lay hands on you um, you might be on death's door uh, but I can't come and visit you if you're on a ventilator um, very interesting and I'm not saying that in a critical way I'm just saying it's very interesting as we observe the world around us um, and actually this isolation um, we need to look at the foundations of our nation. The isolation and separation is something that is not just a recent thing. It's not just an illness or a sickness thing. This is something that has been in the core of our nation for quite a number of years. It's been part of the fabric for quite a number of years. You asked me the question, okay. I've alluded to this before. If you do any study on the First and Second World War and history, and um, you look into what happened, I'm not pros and cons, I'm not saying, you know, power to the Brits or anything. What I'm saying is, when you look at the history of our nations and you wonder why things are going the way they are today, and my marriage and my family and other families and marriages have been affected by some of what we have in society around us, and the church has been affected um, in this way as well, is that in the First and Second World War, uh, we had um, what we call the aspect where there was a call up for the men to go to war. The men went to war. And um, especially um, in the Second World War, we had a lot of our men that went to war that did not come back. A lot of our women, a lot of the mums, a lot of the daughters were encouraged to go down the coal mines, encouraged to go out to work, 13-year-old, 11-year-olds. They were encouraged to do the work of the men. It wasn't because the men weren't interested in their households, but the men were fighting on behalf of our nation. And we found from then, it, I, you know, we, we talk about the 60s boom of the drink, drug, sex, and rock and roll and how that's affected. And 
We talk about computer games um, starting in the late 80s, especially into where we are now, where it's almost like, you know, they're playing these Xboxes and they're walking down the street. It's, you know, they, they have these places where they're walking down the street in America and they just go up to somebody and stab them and rob a bag off them. And it's very virtual to them. Um, and then you wonder why they're walking into streets and they're walking into a park in the middle of, of London and, and just stabbing a 13-year-old girl who stood there or sat there. And then they go, well, I don't know why I've done it, but it's practicing what they see. And our nation is reaping and has reaped over many years now a harvest of the seeds that we've sown. How many of you know that when you sow a seed, you will guarantee a harvest? Guaranteed a harvest. Whether that's a seed of death or a seed of life, you are guaranteed a harvest. Whether that's seed of discouragement or a seed of encouragement, you are guaranteed a harvest. You might not see that harvest in your lifetime, you not, might not see that harvest within five weeks or five months. That's why many of us are still waiting for the promises of the seeds that have been sown. I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about the word seeds that have been sown. And we are reaping a harvest in generations. And I'm a younger generation, maybe more of a faithless generation. My mom and dad have been married quite an over 50-odd years. Nadia's mom and dad have been over 50-odd years. Uh, many people that are in my generation, the mums and dads have been married a long time, very faithful generations. And I'm not belittling, I know there's people in this room that have been married a long time as well in this generation of, of the, the younger eras. But there's been seeds that have been sown that are very negative, that are not that we would be together as a family, but they would be better apart than we are together. Seeds that are sown into children um, that say that, you know, I don't need a father, I don't need a mother, I don't need this in my life. There's marriages where the enemy has got in and felt that I'm better without you than I am with you. I can make better decisions. I can be clearer on my life and my journey as I go forward. And many times we put that down to the 60s, the sex, drink, drugs, rock and roll and all that type of stuff. And actually, I believe as a default, sadly, through our first and second world war, that is what came in. 75% of men were killed off. You look at Burma, you look at Tobruk. My granddad got his eardrums blown out at, at Tobruk. Um, you look at the history of what has happened as our nation where the men were killed off. And today in our society, we are reaping a harvest of a lot of our men being killed off. You look at the church, sadly 70% or 75, maybe even longer now, maybe 80% or so is more women than it is men. You look at situations around us and marriages and how many today um, that it is where they are single parent families. Um, you look at the things around us today where we, we need to have an understanding. And I'm saying this not in a belittling way. I'm not saying this in a negative manner. I'm saying this for us to get a hold of the season where we are and how the enemy is a shapeshifter, how he changes disguise and how he tries to get in, not only into our families, not only into our relationships, but into our church and into our relationship between ourselves and God. My best friend, who was my best man, he had worked uh, in Ireland um, at um, a business, I think it was about 19 years since leaving school. And they turned around to him one day and they said, oh, we're going to have to lay you off. We're, unfortunately, we're going to close and your name, even though you've been one of the longest serving members here, um, we're going to have to ask you to be laid off. And obviously they give him a substantial amount of money. Well, three years down the line, having four children and a, and a mortgage to pay and various things, he's struggling to get a job. He had to fall back, obviously, on the finances that he'd been paid. And with that, he thought, well, I'd invest in paying some of my mortgage off and I'll buy my car outright that I've had higher purchase. And he was able to settle some debts. It left him with a small amount of money. When he got to his fourth or fifth year, all of a sudden, the finances started to dwindle. And because he was older, even though he's experiencing his job, because of the experience, obviously his price per hour was more than it was an 18 year old or a 20 year old. Because, why? Because he was priced his valuation and the worth that he had on his expertise. And obviously then they were offering jobs to younger guys. So he goes into the job center and saying, well, actually, you know, now the money that I had has dwindled down. I don't have it. Can I, I'm looking for work. I'll basically do anything. I'll stack shelves. I'll flip burgers. I need to make some money. I need to bring something in. And you know what was sadly advised to him from the job center was, you know, if you go and separate or you go and get yourself a flat and you live separate from your own 
family, your own children, then you can get housing benefit, you can get work, you can get tax benefits, and your wife and your children were way better off than you are. I mean, praise God, he didn't take that advice, but that was the advice that was given to him. Several people since then that I know of have been given that advice. We can't give you it as a family together, but separately we can. And many of us that are working and earning finances, if you were to separate or you come apart, you would, you, maybe somebody in your family could get the same amount or more than you can based upon advice that is given to us in the seasons where we're in. That is because the enemy, he's a shapeshifter. He is a counterfeit of relationship. If you think he's a counterfeit of truth and he brings lies, he's also a counterfeit of relationship. Because as much as you can endeavor with relationship, the enemy will come to kill, steal, and destroy, as John 10.10 10 says. I believe around the globe with this whole pandemic and this whole situation and where we find ourselves as a nation going into another lockdown is that the enemy is coming to try to sift us, is trying to divide us so that we are not together but we are apart. But how many of you know that we are better together than we are apart? How many of you know that when you're together, you are to gather? <laughs> so when you're together, you gather. And what they don't want us to do is they don't want us to be together, to, to, together on the journey in relationship. They certainly don't want us to be together in asking a question of, why can we have six in a garden but not six in a church hall? They don't want you to ask the questions, but they also want to isolate now, what is one of the tricks and schemes of the enemy? The Bible refers to the enemy. One of the references to him is that he is a lion or as a lion, seeking who he may. The word is the may devour. doesn't guarantee he's going to devour, but who he may devour. Now, again, anybody that's watched anything... You must think I watch a lot. Of, I don't watch a lot of television. I don't, okay. Um, but I do research and I went for a season of watching um, on Sky when I had Sky. I don't have Sky anymore. When I had Sky a number of years ago in watching uh, wildlife animals and safaris. And the lion is a very interesting one because a lion will sit and wait for his prey for a very long time. That's P-R-E-Y, not P-R-A-Y, by the way. Wait for his prey. But if we're not praying, we are prayer. Anyway, that's a topic for another day. Um, so they're waiting for the prayer, but they wait miles away. Then you know that a, a, a roar of a lion can be heard something like, is it 15 to 20 miles away? A roar of a lion can be heard. And what they'll do is the lion will seek to separate people from the pack. Now, you'll find that sheep, goats, pigs, chickens, whatever animal it is, generally lepers, these leopards, sorry, not lepers, these animals, cheetahs, will all generally be together. They grow together. They develop together. When the babies are born, the mother takes care of them till they send them out of the nest. Or they send them out to begin to fight for themselves. But even in that, they tend to go in cubs and twos and threes and fours will go out together to hunt. Bears do it as well. But what the lion does is he can wait for days and months actually. He might not have eaten for months, but he'll wait and he'll observe and he'll watch this flock of cheetahs for a set of time. And he'll wait for one of them that becomes weary and hanging out or wants to be isolated. Or he'll wait for something to draw them out of the pack. They might come across a really nice stream or they might come across an animal that themselves want to eat. Something that looks good, something that smells nice, something that tastes good, something that's a little bit better than where we've just been in the other field. And all of a sudden, that will go off by itself it will become isolated it'll be drawn away now i could do a practical example this morning but unfortunately because of social distancing we can't do that 
But what it would do is it will draw itself away from being together in the family and in the community that it was raised in. And what has happened in our nation, the enemy has been as a lion, and unfortunately, we've allowed him to be the lion. We've given him the authority instead of realizing that actually he has been detoothed, he has been dethroned, he doesn't have the authority, but we've allowed him, Lucifer, the devil, the shapeshifter, to annihilate us, to isolate us, in many ways to intimidate, we have embraced. And actually, we've not realized that the Bible is very clear that two is better than one. Very interesting. That, now, you go to Nat West, bank manager, or Yorkshire Bank. Any mathematicians? I know Pat's a mathematician. I'm sure Alan can do some good maths for me as well. And don't know anybody else. Maybe Heather could fool some. No? Okay, right. Um, you know, some of it. I'm sure Mario knows a pound or two and can put some stuff together. Uh, mathematicians, here's one for you. I love it. God's the best bank manager there ever is. Because it says one can put a thousand to flight. But two, how many? 10,000. How many? 1,000. How many? Two can put how many to fly? 1,000. No, two can put how many? 10,000. That wasn't a trick question. So 1,000 can put how many to fly? 1,000. And 2,000? 10,000. Put that in your calculator and spit it back out again. Wouldn't you love that return? Now, West are doing a good return at the moment on savings, 3%. It's quite good, especially in the situation we're in. If anybody wants to, a bit of a plug there for you, if you had any money to save. Um, but that's an interesting, isn't it? That one can put 1,000, two can put 10,000. <laughs> so now, do you see why Lucifer is more into division than he is to multiplication because there's no way you'll read in the small print of agreement with the enemy that he's going to double your influence there's nowhere in the manual of the Quran where you will read that the enemy is going to allow you to be more powerful as two then you are separate. In fact, the tricks and the schemes of the enemy is to say that Denver Thompson could be more influential and more powerful if I just walk this journey alone. Is it interesting you go back to the Garden of Eden? What was the enemy's strategy? To bring separation between Adam and Eve? The Garden of Gethsemane, what was the enemy's strategy? Jesus is there with all his disciples and the strategy was to isolate Jesus from his destiny and his assignment because he even says, if it be so, take this cup from me. Even Jesus knew that he had to have the connection with his father, but also really the connection with the disciples around him. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. If you need to put the heating on, pop that on. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. In, in a team, there is no I in team. Have you noticed that when it's two, and when it's a team, there is one and the others have got each other's back. If one falters or lose sight of the goal, a good friend will try to encourage and try to steer you on that journey. A real friend, a real relationship is someone that is willing to challenge you to allow you to 
fulfill the destiny and assignment on that journey. A team player, somebody that walks the journey together with you, is somebody that encourages you to be a better you on that journey. 1 Peter 4.10 As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That's why we've been given gifts, so that we can work together, so that we can encourage each other. Together, that word together, we grow, we increase, we expand, we flourish. When we're apart, we isolate, we shrink, we feel lonely. We're open to drift, we're open to become weary. We can lose sight, we can lose strength. Romans 15, 5, now the God of patience, <laughs> who wants the God of patience this morning? And consolation grant you to be like-minded, one to grow together according to Christ Jesus. Once we learn to love one another, the ingredients of love, we, we must remember to consider each other, to consider relationships, and also to prefer others over ourselves. When we see one, someone in a situation of despair or hurt or lack or wounds, that's where the Bible says that we are to look out one for another. It says, if one hurts, then we all hurt. So, you know, Denise is concerned about her son, and rightly she should be concerned about her son. And we, as a family of God, should stand together, pray together, believe together on that journey together. And I would like to think that all of us, no matter what the situation we find ourselves in, that we should be able to encourage each other, express ourselves, and ask for the body of Christ to stand with us to believe and increase on that journey. Again, this is part of working together, being together, that two is better than one. Third John 1 8. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. The other thing is what we do is on this journey is we help each other in discovering the truth. Not the conspiracy theories. Not necessarily trying to find out the truth in society. But trying to find out the truth that is on the inside of each one of us. And encourage each one of us with the characteristics that God has inside of us. Uh, I was speaking to Chris and Mark last night. It's interesting that you have this outline all of a sudden where you've got this Biden guy and then you've got President Trump. Isn't it interesting that everybody wants to know what Biden did and tell us what he did 20 years ago? And I'm sat there going, goodness me, I won't want nobody to tell you what I did 20 years ago. But to get a political stance to make ourselves look good, we always want to make the other person look bad. That is what relationship in the enemy's kingdom is all about. Making the other person look bad. Pulling the faults up of somebody from 20 years ago. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that the Bible says that mercy has triumphed over judgment. The Bible tells me that Christ, he's rolled our sins into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. The issue there is that people like to go fishing from time to time, Alan. So you need to put up a no fishing sign. Because I ain't wanting anybody to go fishing into who I was. Goodness me, it's the 1st of November 2020. I don't want to go back to the 1st of November 1999 or 1989. Let the past be gone. You see, here's the thing. God will never remind you of your past. But he'll always encourage you into the future. The enemy will always remind you of your past and he doesn't want you to have a future. The identity has got to be in true relationship with Jesus Christ. So the key is to emulate God. And how God wanted relationship is how he wants us to be. He wants us to emulate relationship. 
And I'm not saying we get this all together. I'm not saying that I have everything unky dory I don't have all my ducks in a row. I don't have all my T's and I's crossed when it comes to this. But my endeavour as a minister of the gospel, wherever it is, whatever it is, whether it's in a work environment, whether it's in a, 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 on a football pitch, whether it's in a, a restaurant, in a cafe, in Morrison's, whether it's in a pulpit, my endeavour is relationship and family. And I believe the ultimate core devastation of the enemy right now, and as we go into these lockdown scenarios, is that he can bring disillusionment where we begin to feel better alone than we are together. In Christ, in relationship, we should inspire one another to run the race that Christ has called us to. We should inspire others to seek truth and seek love. We should inspire others to seek truth and seek love. Ephesians 4, 32. He says, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, had forgiven you. See, Christ's sake is not a swear word, it's in the Bible. Ephesians 4, 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. A huge part of relationship is forgive, forgiveness. The Bible says that our Heavenly Father can't forgive Denver Thompson if I'm not willing to forgive another person. We're going to come round the table this morning as we did last Sunday. And I wanted to do it this morning, especially because we're not going to see each other physically for a number of weeks. And I felt this morning it was important for us to spend time together to partake of the remembrance of the death, burial, and resurrection. But when we come to this table this morning, we don't just come for forgiveness, but we come receiving the forgiver. I don't know about you, but my golly, we need that in our lives. That we don't just come begging God for forgiveness. We come to the table because it's a two-way relationship. We come not to just have, ask for healing, but we come to receive the healer himself. They say unforgiveness is drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. Relationship always requires that we have unconditional expectations upon ourselves. You hear that word? Ourselves. Sometimes Denver Thompson's requirements is unconditional expectations on another person. But actually, it's the expectations of unconditional love, unconditional giving, has to be in Denver Thompson before I could ever expect, expect it from anybody else. And you ask me, well, why? Because that is who God is. God did it unconditionally himself before he ever expected God to pour out that grace of unconditional love and mercy upon his life and his journey. Again, relationships are built upon the aspect of love, the foundation of truth, to achieve ultimate examples of Christ. This love is truth, truly sustained by forgiveness in God and of God. And so we should follow Christ's example in walking in forgiveness. Drawing to a close this morning, Hebrews 10 and verse 24 let us consider one another, provoking each other unto love and good works. Let us consider one another, provoking one another unto love and good works. That's not prodding somebody in the side and trying to get a reaction out of them. We already have that in our own households. Sometimes people you work with, are, you know, you know how to push a button, don't you? You can say a certain thing, you know how to get that person going. You know what I mean? You know how to get a child going or you know how to get your wife. And sometimes even in joking and coarse jesting, which we, the Bible says we probably shouldn't do. I like a bit of a joke from time to time. But um, we are to poke people in good works and in love, not to get a negative reaction, 
but actually to encourage them on the journey of life. Encouragement in relationship go hand in hand. How simple is that, that we should provoke one another unto love and good works? That's quite a simple, profound kind of statement, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, Jesus Christ, that you also speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. The enemy has come to bring divisions. John 10, 10, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Don't you love the butts of the Bible? But I have come, not Denver Thompson, by the way, <laughs> but Jesus has come that you would have life and life to the full, life more abundant. There'll be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. In the judgment through the blood of of Jesus Christ, there is only relationship and unity through the precious blood of, not uniformity, unity can only come through the blood of Jesus Christ that is multicultural, that has crossed all streams and all boundaries of all tongue, all ethnic groups, every tribe and every tongue, the blood of Jesus Christ does not divide, it unites. Simple instruction for us to recognize that we are called to be part of a body, we are called to be in relationship, and we are called to have the ingredients of love that binds us together in the kingdom. I'm going to take communion this morning. Um, if somebody could grab me a little communion top this morning. We thank you for your body this morning. We thank you that Lord, even through situations and circumstances we find ourselves going through, Lord, in this season, that, Lord, we're able, thank you, we're able to come together to be partakers of your divine nature. We're able to come together to remember the death, the burial, and resurrection. And, Lord, as we importantly remember this morning that two is better than one, we remember, Lord, that your body, Lord, was whipped, was beaten, was discarded by all men so that we could have wholeness of life. And Lord, we bring our weakness, we bring our sicknesses, we bring our broken relationships, broken marriages, Lord, relationships with our children that are broken, with work colleagues, Lord, relationships mentally, physically, and spiritually. Lord, we pray, Lord, for everyone that's represented here, Lord, or even watching this morning, Lord, of New Life Community Church, Lord, that you would, Lord, this morning as we are partakers of this body, that you would bring healing into every situation, every sphere of influence, that as we partake of your body, this emblem, Lord, this morning, this wafer, that is a representation of your body that was whipped, that was beaten, Lord, that, Lord, you, Lord, took our punishment that we would be whole. In the precious name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Lord, we remember your blood this morning. This is a representation. This is not your blood. We are not cannibals. Lord, this is a little bit of juice. It's in a cup, Lord. But remember your blood this morning. That, Lord, your blood is as fresh today as it ever has been. We thank you, Lord, that we can call on you. We can call on your blood. And, Lord, you can redeem us from all unrighteousness. Lord, your blood has not covered our sins. Your blood, Lord, has not just made a stain on our sins. But, Lord, we thank you that your blood, Lord, has deleted and has wiped out the ordinances of sin on our lives. We thank you that, Lord, today we are redeemed, past, present, and future, that you have forgiven us of all unrighteousness. Lord, I claim the blood of Jesus Christ over our lives, mentally, spiritually, physically, over our relationships, Lord, over every aspect of of our lives today, that your blood would redeem, would restore, would renew, 
I pray for forgiveness this morning, every wrong word, deed or action that I have done this week, that you would cleanse me, purify me, cleanse us, purify us in the precious blood of Jesus. Let's take this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord.